members of the constituency or hard-working foot soldiers, welcome. I'd like to also welcome the Deputy Chairman of the Chairman of the Arima Constituency, Kagni Kasimi. Ms. Alessia Guy, the Vice Chairman, other executive members, members of the constituency, all other members, and I recognize people from all over Laoketa, uh, Aruka, Sandy Grandi here tonight, and welcome. Welcome to Davide O'Meara. I'd also like to welcome members of the executive of the PNM. We have our chairman, Senator Franklin Khan, our general secretary, Senator Dukey. We have, I saw Senator Ruan Sinanan and other executive members, members of parliament present. And we have the Minister of Culture here, MP Nayam Gazvidali. The Minister of Health, the Chairman Zial Singh. Minister of Education, Garcia. Minister of Social Development, Kutslo, and of course, our hero of the moment, the Minister, the Acting Attorney General, Fitzgerald Hines. <laughs> we also have many of the Senators in our midst. We have the Minister of Labor, Senator Jennifer Bautiste, Primus. The Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Senator Alison West. We have the Deputy President of the Senate, Senator DeFreitas and Mrs. DeFreitas. Welcome. Welcome all. I'm, see, I'm seeing a number of the uh, local government representatives, the, Arima, the Mayor of Arima, here, the uh, Chairman of Tenapuna Piaco, Mr. Paul Leacock, other councillors, all the men, welcome here tonight. This is W. Mira, as I said, PNM country. But I, I do it in place of me because this will be quick if I make a plug for something that we are having here next Saturday on the 28th of August, right here in W. Mira, we will be having our school, back to school event uh, beginning from 9 to 2, and in the evening from 4 onwards, we'll be having a conversation with the youths where we're inviting the youths to interact with them. This is in conjunction with the PNM Youth League, the PNM Youth Officer, um, uh, and as well as the executive of the, on my MP salary, but we'll definitely be helping the young ladies as they go back to school on the third. Right, so put it in your diary, the 25th of August, next Saturday, and the 1st of September, two continuous Saturday. So welcome to Davide Mira, PNM country, where we do things as winners, as champions. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, MP Antoine. How are you feeling tonight, my friends? Yeah. Lovely, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome to Senator Dennis Moses, Minister of Foreign and Caricom Affairs. Your next speaker, or your first speaker for tonight, and oh, welcome to the Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries, Senator the Honorable Clarence Barat, um, Clarence Ram, Ram Barat. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker carries the mantle or the title of Minister of Education. He is but one in a long line of Ministers of Education that the PNM has put forward to you over the years. That the future of our country is in the school bags of our children because he recognized back then that education was a great social equalizer. It is the PNM that championed GATE, free tertiary education. It is the PNM, it is the People's National Movement that has the interest of our children from primary, from nursery to tertiary at heart. And in that vein, I want you to welcome tonight with a lusty round of applause, the latest in a long line of excellent PNM Ministers of Education, the Honorable Member of Parliament for Arima, Anthony Garcia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, and the political leader of the People's National Movement. 
the Honorable Keith Imbert, Minister of Finance and the Member of Parliament for Diego Martin Northeast. I am told he will be here in a while. The Honorable Brigadier Ansel Antoine, retired, Member of Parliament for W. Mera. The Honorable Sherian Kitchlow Coburn, MP for Lopino Bonia West, and the Minister of Social Development and the Family Services, the Minister of Labor, the Honorable Jennifer Batiste, the Minister of Culture, Nayan Gatsby Dolly. Other cabinet ministers, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, it is always a pleasure of mine to address members of the People's National Movement, and in particular, members of this great party as we meet tonight to chat with you on some of our achievements. The People's National Movement, as we have been saying all along, is a party, a political party, like no other. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we have been doing so many good things that I'm sure that when the election bell is rung in 2020, the People's National Movement will be returned to office. <clears throat> We have been in office for a little less than three years. And one of our outstanding achievements is the fact that no one, no one in this country can point a finger at our party or at our government accusing us of any misdeeds. <clears throat> we have been steadfast in what we have decided to do and the benefits that we have pledged to bring to our people in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm proud tonight to say that we have succeeded to a large extent in spite of the fact that we achieved or we were experiencing some challenges with respect to our economy. But I can safely say that we have been on the road to success in so many areas. As a party, we have been paying close attention to persons who have made tremendous contributions to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. And towards this end, this party has been the only party and the only government to recognize the sterling contributions of our First Peoples. And tonight, I must pay tribute to our First Peoples for what they have been doing for this country. And this government has recognized the stolen contributions of the First Peoples. And as a result of that, we had a one-off public holiday on October the 13th last year. This has gone down very well with our First Peoples, and we continue to provide support. In fact, only recently, we had the opportunity and the honor to give to the chief, on behalf of the government, the lease for 25 acres of land. And the First Peoples have pledged that they're going to use this land so that they will have established an Amerindian village, which I'm sure will be the pride and joy of all of us in Trinidad and Tobago. We have had so many successes in Arima, in Davido Mera, in Lupido Bonia West. Where the velodrome is concerned, I wish to state that the velodrome was the first playing field that was lit, and that was done by the People's National Movement. This year, we had the opportunity of upgrading the lighting system, which now offers comfortable recreational facilities 
during the evening sessions. And for this, I want to thank the Arima Borough Council and others. <laughs> Earlier this week, the Minister of Health had a tour of the Arima Hospital, of the new Arima Hospital. And he has informed the general public that the new Arima Hospital will come on stream sometime in October 2019. Or June, oh, I've been corrected, June, July 2019. We all look forward to this because in Arima, we have been looking forward to a new hospital. And it is only with the People's National Movement government that we can feel secure that the people of Arima and the surrounded areas will have the benefit of a new, a brand new hospital. <laughs> On Tuesday, our Prime Minister had the opportunity and the pleasure of distributing documents to 78 owners, housing owners, at an area that is referred to as River Runs Through. And those 78 persons have pledged their assistance and their commitment to this government. And we look forward to great things from that community. I have been told also that in the not too distant future, there will be distribution of housing units in Malabar, at Treasury Lands, and at Bonnier, which is close to the Basut. And I want to assure all our, all our people, persons from the surrounding constituencies, that even if you are not granted the opportunity of receiving a housing unit this time around, better days are coming. So be patient, and you will get your just due. In Blanchichers, in La Fillette, in Brasso Sacred Paria, in, a, in a repo, those far-flung districts that belong to the Arima constituency, we have not neglected those constituencies. In fact, in Blanchichers, the Ministry of Works has been conducting a tremendous amount of work in that area and the Lafayette Bridge is now being constructed. And this is a bridge that is going to help a lot. I've been told by the Minister of Works also that the next construction will be the, Marian, the bridge over the Marion River. Also, we have done a complete refurbishment of the community centers in Lafayette and also in Blanchichez. And the Aripo Community Center will follow next. Throughout Arima and Davide Omera, you will see that we have most of our, of our roads beautifully paved. And this is the work of the government inspired by the Arima Borough Council. And I want to thank the Arima Borough Council for working diligently in ensuring that some of these infrastructural works are done and are done to the best of our ability. Thank you very much. We now have CPEP teams operating throughout the constituencies, and from the feedback that we have been receiving, they are doing a tremendous job. I want to thank them and congratulate them for what they're doing. And as the Minister of Education, I cannot neglect the tremendous work that has been done by the Ministry of Education. This year, for the first time over the last 10 years, we have been able to achieve tremendous success or tremendous successes in all the examinations that our students are, um, write. In terms of the secondary sector, the CSEC exam, as I indicated yesterday, we have seen a marked improvement in the performance of our students and also at the level of CAPE. Tremendous improvement. We are going to have a difficult time in deciding on scholarship, on scholarship winners because so many of our students 
who wrote the Cape examinations have done tremendously well. In the area of discipline in our schools, I have been saying over and over, and I take the opportunity to repeat it once again, that we have been able to achieve a marked reduction in the level of violence and indiscipline in our schools. Some people would ask, what is the evidence? There's one small bit of evidence that I would like to share with you. For a number of years, at the end of each term, there were school fights, in particular, at the end of each academic year. This year, when school closed in July, there was not one fight among students in our schools. And this is only a small indication of what we have been doing. So many things that we have been doing in education, I am sure that if I use the time to describe it, I will not be able, or will not be able to hear from the other speakers. And therefore, I leave you with the, with the knowledge that we are doing our best as a government to ensure that our people get the right representation that they deserve. Long live the PNM. Long live the PNM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Garcia. There you got a report on the activities of your Minister of Education, Minister Anthony Garcia, Member of Parliament for the great constituency of, of, of Arima. Our next speaker, our next speaker is the Honorable Sherry Ann Critchlow. But we need to understand why our political leader is so astute in having her follow the Minister of Education. The PNM has never separated education from social development. The two things go hand in hand, like ring and finger. You cannot have social development without an educated population. And what is social, ed social development about? It's about people. It's about putting people at the center of your activities. And that is why the name of this party is the People's National Movement. It's a movement of people putting people where? First, the People's National Movement. In that vein, in that vein, one must recognize the same way that the PNM literally invented education in Trinidad. The People's National Movement from Dr. Eric Williams to Mr. George Michael Chambers, God bless his soul, wherever he is in a good place. The Honorable Patrick Manning, a good man wherever he is. And now Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley. All four PNM Prime Ministers have always recognized the importance of social development and of putting people where? First. The same way you put God first in your lives, the PNM puts people first. What we do in the PNM is put support for the vulnerable and transition them to the independent. That is what social development is. It's about putting people where they ought to be, at the center of your policy-making universe. And in that vein, it is my distinct pleasure, my distinct pleasure, to invite to the podium one, Sherry Ann Critchlow Kerbone, the Minister of Social Development and Family Services, to address you, to tell you, to bring a report on what this government has been doing for the social sector. Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and political leader of the People's National Movement. My cabinet colleagues at the head table and in the audience, MPs, Chairman, Mayor, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, the People's National Movement members and supporters. Good evening. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this evening it is my distinct pleasure to be here 
and I want to treat with a particular aspect of the opposition's and the PNM's detractors' messaging. There is a trend developing in Trinidad and Tobago where the opposition and our detractors seek to describe and portray this PNM government as uncaring. Ladies and gentlemen, this description has no basis in fact. Nothing concrete is provided to support it. It is just thrown out there with the, with the intention that if you hear it often enough, you would begin to believe it. Secondly, it's a subliminal message. So over time, what can happen to us, the impact is that it goes into our very brain, our minds, our psyche, and we start to repeat it and we start to believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, it is my intention to disavow your minds of any belief that the people's national movement is uncaring. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, our very philosophy is grounded in caring and the protection of the vulnerable in our society. So any party or any government that has as its foundation caring for people cannot be uncaring. Minister of Health, our chairman, indicated just now the very name of our party, the People's National Movement. We have put people first from the beginning, we put people first now, and we will put people first once we continue to be in existence. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to put the opposition's and the detractors' message of uncaring within a context. And particularly for the UNC, it is out of sheer desperation. The UNC has been looking for something negative to portray and to project about this government. They have not been able to find anything concrete. Early, they had the audacity to mention corruption. But they have been one of the most corrupt governments to ever pass through Trinidad and Tobago. And so, what you find now is that they resist the word temptation. Because every time they come with temptation, we hit them for six. Because they cannot speak to us about corruption. This government is one of the least corrupt governments I think I have ever seen in Trinidad and Tobago. The second message they tried to send was incompetence. This government is incompetent. But ladies and gentlemen, if this government has been incompetent, you should always ask for and vote for an incompetent government. Because we have been able to take this government from all of the challenges, all of the negatives that we were experiencing with the economic downturn and bring Trinidad and Tobago on an even keel. Ladies and gentlemen, the Minister of Finance and our Prime Minister have worked together with all of the Cabinet Ministers and we have now been placed on a sustainable path. Even the pundits and the detractors out there are now saying that we are on the road to recovery. So ladies and gentlemen, what incompetence? We recently unveiled our crime plan because there are two major issues that people in Trinidad and Tobago have been grappling with. The, the economy, which we have dealt with, and we are now on an even keel, we are on the road, we are on the path to sustainability and crime. We would have launched our crime plan. And ladies and gentlemen, I sat at the Hilton and listened to that crime plan, and I believe it is going to be a very effective crime plan. We have also been able to do what they were not able to do. We have selected and appointed a commissioner of police. gentlemen, the UNC is desperate, and in their desperation, they are seeking to confuse you by saying to you, we are uncaring. But ask yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, will an uncaring government spend $4.4 billion simply to ensure the maintenance of a safety net for our most vulnerable citizens? Ladies and gentlemen, Despite our straightened economic situation, over the last three years and even currently, this government has maintained every social, secure, every social services benefit at the same quantum and it is paid with the same frequency 
and on time. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to let this sink in. This was a government that did not know at times how we were going to pay salaries. This is a government that had to dig deep to ensure the economic survival of Trinidad and Tobago. But despite all of that, because of our caring for our people and because we put people first, we have maintained all of our social services benefit at the same levels and the same quantum and paid to the same frequency. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if that is not testimony to this government's care commitment to care for and protect our vulnerable, then I don't know what is. And there are 143,226 persons who can attest to this because every month they are paid either a senior citizen's pension, a public assistance grant, or a disability grant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are three major social protection grants. First one is the senior citizen pension, and that is currently paid to 95,695 persons at a cost of, as of to July, of $2.96 billion, ladies and gentlemen. And to be eligible for this senior citizen pension, you must be 65 and over, you must have lived in Trinidad and Tobago for at least 50 years, and your income must not be more than 4,500, ladies and gentlemen. Simple, simple. So those are the persons in Trinidad and Tobago who are eligible to receive a senior citizen pension. And then we have the public assistance grant, which is currently paid to 24,199 individuals and families. And this grant is paid in situations where the household income is deemed inadequate. We have situations where persons are unable to work because of a mental or physical disability. We have single parents who are unable to earn a living because they have to care for children who may have a physical disability. We have children whose parents may have died or may, who may be incarcerated or who may have abandoned the family. Ladies and gentlemen, we have spouses who may have been in prison and the, the, the remaining spouses are unable to earn a living because they have to care for their children. Ladies and gentlemen, this government, we take care of all of those people. And currently, we are taking care of 24,199 persons. And that, ladies and gentlemen, costs us $334 million as of July of this year. We have the disability grant, which is $1,800 per month. And ladies and gentlemen, this is paid to persons who are deemed permanently disabled from earning a living. And it is currently paid, ladies and gentlemen, to 23,322 persons at a cost of $431 million as of July of this year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let that sink in. This government is taking care every month of 143,226 persons, and that is their income. They survive on that income, and because we recognize that, we have not interfered with their income in any way. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that is not all. We have 12 general assistance grants, and these grants are normally paid to clients of the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, for example, you may be in receipt of a disability grant or the senior citizen pension or public assistance grant. It is also paid to vulnerable persons in crisis or emergency situations and to victims of natural disaster. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the first one I want to bring to your attention is a special child grant. This is a grant of $800 per month, and it is to assist parents of children with severe disorders who are unable to meet the cost of caring for their child. And we have the dietary grant. Ladies and gentlemen, some of us, because of illness, have to be on special diets, but we are maybe unable to meet the cost of this item. We provide a dietary grant of $600 per month 
and this is paid to persons whose doctor would have indicated that they need to have special diets. We have a domestic health grant of $1,800 and we paid for a maximum of six months. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many persons in Trinidad and Tobago today who because of surgery or because of some illness or a disability is unable to perform their normal household chores and they are unable to afford the cost of health. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services provides a domestic help grant to the tune of $1,800 per month to assist persons in such circumstances. There is also a pharmaceutical grant of $2,500. This is paid for a maximum of three months every year, and it is for prescription drugs that are not available under CDAP or at the health dispensaries. So ladies and gentlemen, let that sink in. In addition to providing free medical attention, we recognize that there are persons who need certain prescription drugs that they may not get via CDAP, and we assist by providing them with a three-month supply of $2,500 per month. Ladies and gentlemen, we now live in a society where a number of persons are suffering with lifestyle diseases. One of those happens to be diabetes. And every year, ladies and gentlemen, a number of persons suffer the loss of limbs. We also have persons who may have been involved in accidents and they may have suffered the loss of limbs. Ladies and gentlemen, in an effort to help them in their rehabilitation and reintegration, we provide a prosthetic grant. Generally, it is to the tune of $40,000. But we recognize there may be exceptional circumstances for example, recently we had a young lady from Tobago who is a double amputee. So we would have provided her with a grant of $75,000 so that she can be mobile. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say to you that over the last year, we would have spent $2 million to provide 59 persons with prosthetics. Thus far this year, we have provided 59 additional persons and we have 33 ap applications approved to the cost of $102 million and we expect to be providing those before the end of this month. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is also a medical equipment grant of $7,500 and this is for needy persons who may require special beds, wheelchairs, even dentures and eyeglasses, ladies and gentlemen. I am sure most of you were not aware that this government assists persons who require dentures and eyeglasses. And we provide that up to a maximum of $7,500. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you and the wider public know, if you require a wheelchair, all you have to supply to the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services is a copy of your ID card and a letter from a registered medical practitioner indicating that you require a wheelchair. And that could be provided the same day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we also provide an education grant. And this education grant is intended to assist persons whose income is derived from the public assistance grant and the food card. And because of that income, they may not be able to provide their children with transport and school supplies. And so we provide them with a $500 per month to assist them via the education grant. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us sitting here, God forbid, we would not like to be the victims of either a natural or man-made disaster. But it happens. And in such instances, ladies and gentlemen, where these persons would have suffered the loss of all their school supplies. The ministry provides $700 per child at the primary level and $1,000 per child at the secondary level where they would have lost their school books or their school uniforms, any school supplies. We provide, we provide a clothing grant of $1,000 per person in the household where there would have been a natural disaster and persons would have lost their clothing. And we provide a household item grant, ladies and gentlemen. Where there is a natural disaster, persons may suffer the loss of all of their furniture. 
And so we provide a grant under normal circumstances. It's to the value of 6,000, but where there is a disaster, it is provided to the value of $10,000. And that is for the replacement of bed, stove, washing machine, that type of thing, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to impress upon you, ladies and gentlemen, because we recognize that when there is a disaster, it doesn't really matter what your income may be because you would have lost everything. And so there is no qualifying criteria for the disaster grants other than you would have proven that you did in fact suffer the loss of everything as a result of the disaster. Ladies and gentlemen, having heard about those things thus far, do you and any part of your mind believe that this big government is uncaring? No. Very well. Now we have also have a rental assistance grant. There are persons who may be facing eviction, they may be victims of domestic violence, or again, they may be disaster victims, and they are unable to pay or a rent, but they need accommodation, and they are unable to meet the initial payments. Ladies and gentlemen, we provide a rental assistance grant to the value of $2,500 per month for up to six months. At the end of that period, we will do an assessment, and if it is deemed that you are still in need of assistance, we will provide a further grant of $1,500 for another three months, and thereafter for another three months for $1,000. Ladies and gentlemen, this government wants to ensure that its citizens have a roof over their head, and this is why we provide this rental assistance grant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is sometimes a very heart-rending situation where you may have somebody who would have died and their relatives are unable to finance their burial. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody likes to be placed in that situation. We at the Ministry of Social Development, recognizing that, provides a grant of $7,000 to assist persons with the burial of their loved ones. And ladies and gentlemen, it is, one of, it is one of the easiest grants to get. You simply bring in the, sorry, the invoices from the funeral home and a copy of the death certificate. And we try to ensure that it is processed and paid within one day. If that cannot be done within one day, we contact the funeral home and give a guarantee that we would make the payment, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this government wants to ensure that its citizens, even though they may be in vulnerable circumstances, live in safe and comfortable shelter. And to this end, we provide a minor house repair grant. This grant is normally provided to the value of $15,000, but if you suffer a disaster, we provide a grant of $20,000, ladies and gentlemen. And this is for roof repairs or minor structural repairs to your house. If you have problem, ladies and gentlemen, with wiring in your house, we provide an electrical house wiring grant, and this is to a maximum of $25,000, ladies and gentlemen. We are also seeking, ladies and gentlemen, to ensure the eradication of outhouses and latrines. So we provide a sanitary plumbing grant, ladies and gentlemen, and this is to the value of $15,000, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, you can clearly see that this government intends to ensure that all of its citizens live in comfortable surroundings. But ladies and gentlemen, as any caring parent, it is your duty to ensure that you bring your children from a state of dependency to a state of independence and self-sustainability. And that is what we also attempt to do at the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. We seek to move our clients from a state of dependency onto a path of self-sustainability. And to this end, ladies and gentlemen, we provide adult education classes. We have primary school leaving. We have CXC, maths, and English for those persons who require those two subjects to make up their certificate. And we do skills training at the NEC level one. There are currently, ladies and gentlemen, 4,000 persons enrolled at 26 centers throughout Trinidad and Tobago. And in that way, ladies and gentlemen, we are helping those persons to stand on their own two feet. Yes.
ladies and gentlemen, we also want to develop that entrepreneurial spirit in our clients and in our citizens. And to this end, the, the, um, sorry, we provide a grant of $15,000 to our clients who are willing and capable to undertake small business ventures. Ladies and gentlemen, we provide them with the grant. We provide them with training in bookkeeping, in accounting, in marketing, so that they are better able to manage their businesses. And ladies and gentlemen, we have an officer who works alongside them so that they can have the support necessary so that their ventures can become successful. So ladies and gentlemen, our caring doesn't stop at just providing things to person. As any good caring parent, we ensure that our children and our clients move from dependency to self-sustainability. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is said that our basic needs are food, shelter, and clothing. I have dealt with shelter, I have dealt with clothing, and now I come to food support. This is one area of the ministry where there is a lot of confusion, I believe, ladies and gentlemen. And so this evening, I want to let you know the food support is intended to be short-term assistance. So what is done every six months, we review these clients to determine if they would have moved from the state where they are and can now stand on their own. This food support also targets individuals and families who are in need, who are in vulnerable situations, and experience difficulty in meeting their nutritional needs. And that, that inability is due to limited or no income. So I want you to understand very clearly, ladies and gentlemen, the food card or the food support was not intended for anybody who just wanted it. It was intended for persons who are unable to provide the nutritional needs of their families and themselves. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, we have the UNC government who is trying to convince this country that we are uncaring. But this is the same government that during their tenure would have implemented a biometric system to support the food card that cost this government $97 million, was never fully implemented, and supported only 3,158 persons out of a total of 42,000 persons, ladies and gentlemen. Do you consider that to be caring? No, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we had those, we had that government spending $2.7 million coming down to the end to pay $1.7 million to 2% of the persons who were in receipt of the food card. Ladies and gentlemen, this government, being a caring government and recognizing the situation that we were in in this country, decided that could not continue. We had to get value for money while at the same time ensuring that the persons who were in need and eligible for food support were provided with such support. So ladies and gentlemen, what did we do? We decided to engage in a revalidation and recertification exercise of all persons who were in receipt of the food card. Ladies and gentlemen, approximately 13,000 people did not come in. So when you see the UNC and the detractors come to say to you, this government is wicked, it is uncaring, they take back people food card. We have not taken back any food cards. What we have done is sought to ensure that the persons who are in receipt of food support are persons who are eligible for it and persons who are in need and cannot feed their families. <clears throat> And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have been able to remove or have drop off from the system approximately 18,000 persons. What this has meant for this country, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have been able to save approximately $150 million annually. Think about all that we can do with $150 million. We can provide more prosthetics. We can provide more caregivers. We can provide the Minister of Health can provide more dialysis to persons who I need. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we, are, we take our responsibility very seriously. 
and we are convinced that the action we have taken in terms of the food support and the food card has been justified. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you an example. Last week, we had to remove 1,376 persons who have food cards from the system. Why? Because they have not used the card since December 2017. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let that sink in. Food support is intended for persons who are desperately in need and cannot provide food. If you have not utilized your food support card in six months, clearly you do not need it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have removed them from the system. Some of you may have noticed in the daily newspaper we have been running an ad asking persons to come in for recertification. It is in excess of 3,000 names. And the reason that is there, ladies and gentlemen, is because we have not been able to find them. We have not been able to contact them. We, they do not exist, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we, this caring government, who takes its responsibility very seriously, has ensured that we will remove them from the system if they do not come in by the date we have given. And it is very noteworthy. If you look at that ad, look at some of the areas. There is one particular co regional corporation area where there are, we had to use three pages to print those names. Ask yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, what was going on? And why were certain peoples in certain areas being granted food cards when clearly they were not eligible for it? And so, ladies and gentlemen, we will press on. One of my constituents said to me recently, MP, two persons were talking what they are saying, they're not supporting you anymore because you're wicked, you take back the food card. I said, who are those persons? Ladies and gentlemen, two persons, both of them police officers and, cl and complaining about their food card being taken back. In the first instance, they should not have had a food card because of their income. And s thank you very much. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this government and this MP has no problem with not having the support of people like those because we will not do wrong, we will not condone wrong just to get support. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we currently provide food support to 25,455 persons. And since our recertification exercise, we have been able to bring on 8,000 well-deserving persons onto the system. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, caring for and protecting our vulnerable is primary, of primary concern to us, but we recognize we cannot do it by ourselves. And so we incorporate civil society as partners in the provision of social services. Ladies and gentlemen, currently we partner with 24 NGOs, and this includes NGOs like Family Planning Association, Lifeline, South Aid Support Group, and three statutory boards, Trinidad and Tobago Association for Retired Persons, Trinidad and Tobago Association for the Hearing Impaired, and the Trinidad and Tobago Blind Welfare Association. Now, ladies and gentlemen, remember we are operating a time of economic constraint, but despite that, to ensure that the necessary services are provided to our people. We have partnered with NGOs and we have paid them 30.8 million thus far this year. Last year we would have paid subventions to a tune of $41 million, ladies and gentlemen. And so, now I want to speak to you about persons with disabilities. This is one of our very vulnerable groups in society in Trinidad and Tobago. And ladies and gentlemen, Currently, half of that approximately half of that population receives the Disability Assistance Grant. We have NGOs that we provide subventions to. The National Center for Persons with Disabilities in San Fernando, Autism Services, Goodwill, Trinidad and Tobago Chapter of Disabled Persons. And ladies and gentlemen, these subventions ensure that these persons are well taken care of. We have the Eldamo service, which provide a free bus service to elderly persons and persons with disability. 
you call up for the service, it picks you up at home and it drops you back at home. Ladies and gentlemen, we currently service 10,200 persons on this Eldamo service. Cabinet has also recently approved the national policy for persons with disabilities. What this means, ladies and gentlemen, is that these persons can expect an enhanced standard of living. They can expect better job opportunities. As a matter of fact, I'm seeing my friend, the Minister of Labor, sitting there. We have been meeting with the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprises Development and the private sector with a view to securing employment for persons with disabilities, ladies and gentlemen. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to spend a little time speaking about the National Enrichment Center in Castlefield. Recently, I saw the former minister jumping out of himself and indicating that this government cannot open the center. Ladies and gentlemen, the UNC launched that center in 2015. When we came into office expecting to operationalize the center, it was only to recognize that this supposedly caring UNC government had the center built, it was not built to brief. The bathrooms and the pool were not in accordance with established standards. The elevator cannot hold a wheelchair. If you're going, you have to reverse out of the elevator. The rooms were not built to afford training and therapeutic exercises for persons with certain disabilities. And worst of all, ladies and gentlemen, there were no statutory approvals for the building. So the UNC launched a building for the population in Trin of Trinidad and Tobago, wanting them to believe that they care when the center could not be operationalized. And then they bold-facedly had the audacity to ask this government why we have not operationalized the center. Ladies and gentlemen, we have not operationalized it because it is still a construction site, and we had to get a number of things done. So thus far, we have had the integrity of the building confirmed. We have identified all of the repairs that need to be done. And ladies and gentlemen, come September, some of you will be invited to the opening of the National Enrichment Center. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, in addition to income support for our elderly, we provide subventions to senior citizen homes we also have a program called the Community Care Program. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there are some persons who may have been hospitalized and when they are discharged, they have no family or nowhere to go. We at the Ministry of Social Development in partnership with the Ministry of Health take those persons and place them in these homes where they are well cared for. There are currently 55 such persons in our Community Care Program, ladies and gentlemen. So we are taking care of the young, the not so young, and the elderly. We are taking care of everybody, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there are some persons who would have contributed significantly to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. And now in their latter years, they are experiencing hardship. And in recognition of their contribution to the development of this country, ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services provides a Special Achievers Grant. This grant, ladies and gentlemen, is to assist with the house, housing, health, and income support of those persons. We currently have such 42 such persons being provided for, ladies and gentlemen, and in terms of income, we provide them with the difference between their current income and $8,000 to a maximum of $8,000. In terms of housing, we, we pay for the cost of repairs to their homes, or we provide a rental subsidy up to a maximum of $2,000. And in terms of their medical expenses, up to 70% 70, up to 70 of the annual cost not exceeding 70,000, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, doesn't our government have to be extremely caring to look back at its special achievers and decide to ensure that they are well taken care of. And this is what this government is doing, ladies and gentlemen. We also live in a society, ladies and gentlemen, where the extended family is fast disappearing. And we have a number of elderly persons who live on their own and may not be able to care for themselves. 
And so, ladies and gentlemen, under the Geriatric Adolescent Partnership Program, we train caregivers and then we assign caregivers to these persons. Ladies and gentlemen, at any given point in time, we have 600 such caregivers within the system and they are paid a stipend of $2,500 monthly. Ladies and gentlemen, last year we spent $21.3 million in providing caregivers to our elderly and thus far for this 2018, we have spent $16.4 million. And ladies and gentlemen, we will continue to ensure that we take care of our elderly. We also provide opportunities for an active lifestyle for our senior citizens, ladies and gentlemen. To this end, we provide subventions to nine senior activity centers, and these centers are spread throughout North, Central, and South Trinidad. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, we would have paid $3.2 million in subventions, but we think it is money well spent because our elderly have the opportunity to interact with one another. They can provide, they are provided with skills training. They also provided with exercise. They also go on sightseeing tours. So ladies and gentlemen, they are provided with the opportunity to live a full and active life. Even though they may be elderly, they are not disabled. They can still make a contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, our elderly are also provided with free transport on our PTSC buses and the ferry service between Trinidad and Tobago. Free transport is also provided to school children on the PTSC buses. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to speak to you now about the socially displaced in our, in our society. These persons are taken care of, ladies and gentlemen, in San Fernando at Court Shamrock. We have 47 living persons, and on an afternoon, once you present yourself there by 4.30, you are provided with a shelter for the night, and we can accommodate up to 25 persons. In Port of Spain, we have the Center for Socially Displaced Persons, where there are currently 113 residents, and we can hold up to a maximum of 160 persons. And these shelters provide an area for persons to sleep, to be provided with a meal, and to have a bath. So ladies and gentlemen, we are taking care of our socially displaced. Recently, we would have implemented, sorry, the, the committee to treat with the report from the Street Dwellers Working Committee. Now basically this, the recommendation that is going to most impact street, these, street, these Street Dwellers, ladies and gentlemen, is the continuum of care. So it works from engagement, to treatment, to rehabilitation, and integration. So we are going to be taking them through those four stages, ladies and gentlemen. And at the end of it, we recognize that there would be need for some transitional housing, because if that is not provided, they may end up on the streets again, ladies and gentlemen. So in the short term, we have identified the old Besson Street Police Station. We are going to retrofit it and have it as an assessment center and transitional housing. In the longer term, we are going to be constructing a permanent assessment center in Port of Spain. We had identified an area on South Key, and that is where we have plans to construct the permanent center. We are yet to identify an area in San Fernando, but we are also going to be having a permanent center in San Fernando. And ladies and gentlemen, at the Piparo Empowerment Center, where we treat substance abusers. There are currently 15 persons in rehab. And this, ladies and gentlemen, the Piparo Empowerment Center is probably one of our greatest successes. We currently have two persons who would have gone through that rehabilitation program who now work at the Piparo Empowerment Center. They went through the program successfully and have proven themselves to be able and up to the task, and they have now been employed, ladies and gentlemen, to work at the Piparo Empowerment Center. Ladies and gentlemen, tell me, after having heard all that I have said to you this evening, what is your decision in terms of this government? Are we a caring government, ladies and gentlemen? Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that the family is the bedrock of society. And to this end, we provide counseling 
For this year, we have counseled 4,275 persons. We also provide referrals and we provide parenting training workshops. Ladies and gentlemen, we recently hosted the National Family Forum, and that is going to be the precursor to the preparation of the family policy, the national family policy for Trinidad and Tobago. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we recognize if we get the family right, then we are more likely to get Trinidad and Tobago right. And, ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that with all of these things that we provide, we need to still improve our customer service. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in an effort to ensure that persons who receive the senior citizen pension, disability grant, public assistance grant, do not experience problems with lost or stolen checks, we have implemented the direct method of payment. Ladies and gentlemen, currently we have transitioned 76,517 persons to direct deposit, and we are hoping to have 90% of all of our clients transition by the first quarter of the next financial year. We are also providing our staff with training in customer service because we recognize it doesn't make sense having excellent benefits if persons are not provided with excellent service. And to this end, ladies and gentlemen, we have done that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this government recognizes substance over form. The UNC was form, not substance. So they bamboozle you with ads, with stories, and at the end of the day, our social services, our safety net was not intact. This government, because it cares for the people, because we put people first, we have been able, ladies and gentlemen, to add value, and we have been able to demonstrate that this is a caring government, ladies and gentlemen, and our caring is epitomized by value for money and caring for and the protection of the vulnerable and the poor in society. Ladies and gentlemen, great is the PNM and it shall be good. You know, she ended by saying great is the PNM. But it's only now people outside listening to minister know why we say great is the PNM. I stopped counting. I stopped counting after the 30 year grant minister. I stopped counting. Because you know why great is the PNM? Because you're providing prosthetics up to $40,000. Great is the PNM. Same day wheelchairs, minister, great is the PNM. Family support, prescription drugs, medical equipment grant, that is why the PNM is great. Dental and glasses, that is why we say great is the PNM. $500 a month education grant, that is why we say great is the yeah. food support, great is the PNM. To those listening outside, those of us in the PNM know why we are great. The minister has just told this population grant after grant after grant targeted to those who need it the most. And that is what we must celebrate. Ladies and gentlemen, I can feel the energy here tonight. Come on, give yourselves a round of applause, man. This crowd has grown. We have no more room inside, but we have room outside. And I'm coming back to outside and inside just now. To the listening audience, we wish you were here. To those listening on the radio and the internet, we wish you were here. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to introduce a man the Minister of Finance. But I want you to understand where this Minister of Finance has taken this country from and where we have reached today and where we are going to go in the future. Remember I spoke about integrity? He has put back integrity and confidence into our economy. And don't take my word for it. Take the word of Eklak the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Take the word of Standard and Poor's. This is the man, this is the man who has kept inflation low. This is the man 
who is helping to increase your, your gas sector. This is the man who has taken revenue up in the right direction. This is the man who has reinvigorated the non-oil sector. This is the man who spoke recently about economic expansion. Do you know what that means? It means the Minister of Social Development can get more millions to bring more food to you, more grants to you, more housing grants. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say finally that the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Colm Imbert, is a national treasure and invite him to the podium with a round of applause. That is, that is reminiscent of how we treat a national treasure. Hello. Minister of Finance, the Honorable Colm Imbert. Thank you, Minister Dial Singh. You're reminding me of some old PNM meetings 20 years ago when the chairman had a lot of energy. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Dr. the Honorable Keith Rowley, political leader of the People's National Movement, Prime Minister, and Member of Parliament for Dago Martin West. Other members of the head table, Member of Parliament for St. Joseph, Farima, W. Omera, Lopino Bonier, members of the PNM executive and leadership, local government representatives, my cabinet colleagues, members of the House of Representatives and the Senate, PNM members, the media, well wishers, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. I'm going to speak primarily on two matters tonight. The first one is on the tremendous success of a recent government initiative, which you would have heard a lot about over the last two months or so, and that is the National Investment Fund bonds, or NIF bonds for short. But I need to give you some history on how we arrived at this place. When we got into government, early in the term, I was visited by shareholders of a company called CL Financial. And they came to talk to me about an agreement between the government and the CL Financial Group. And this agreement had started way back in 2009 and 2010. And in those days, when the Clico Group collapsed and the government of the day, a PNM government, moved in to bail out Clico because of the risk to the economy. There was an agreement that the government would take control of the companies associated with the Clico Group, would put money into Colonial Life in particular. In fact, we put $5 billion in between 2009 and 2010, and that $5 billion we put into Clico, Colonial Life in particular, was designed to assist the company to pay its policies, to make payments to its policyholders, to keep afloat. The PNM government also bailed out depositors of Clico Investment Bank, or CIB. That was taken over by First Citizens Bank, and the vast majority of depositors, unless you had some issue, you were what was called a connected party, were given their deposits with Clico Investment Bank in full by the PNM government. That was a substantial injection of funds. And we continued at that time to prop up Clico and the other CL financial companies because there were so many people involved, so many policyholders were at risk, and the economy was at risk. But the government changed. 
The initial intention was that that situation would last for three years. So the ag initial agreement was designed to expire in three years. Government change, and what happened instead is that when the three years were up, around 2012, instead of the problem being solved, the CLECO problem, the agreement was extended for a couple months because the problem had not been solved, despite what had been said by several UNC ministers of finance who had claimed they had solved the problem. The problem had not been solved. The problem was still there. So the agreement was extended and extended and extended. And when we came in, it had been extended 16 or 17 times from 2009 all the way up to 2015. But it was due to expire in 2016. And when it expired, the CL financial shareholders started to, I would say, dance a little bit. And the agreement was not extended. So we as a government found ourselves now exposed because over this period of about seven years, eight years, successive governments had put a huge sum of money into CL Financial and Colonial Life and Clico Investment Bank. When we did the numbers, the count, we found that it was in excess of $23 billion of taxpayers' money that had gone into bailing out Clico and the Clico group of companies. So the agreement expired and the CL shareholders told us they're not renewing it. And then they started to make attempts to take control of the company, which would have led to a situation where the entire $23 billion or a substantial part of it of taxpayers' funds would have been jumping up. They wanted to walk away with all the companies and there was no guarantee they would repay the $23 billion. So we decided to do something that was unprecedented. We decided to put CL Financial into liquidation. And we did that in order to preserve and protect the people's money, the taxpayers' funds, the 23 plus billion that had been put into this group. There were so many naysayers out there, they said we couldn't do it. They said it had never been done before, it couldn't be done, that we were not a guaranteed creditor, the government was not a secured creditor of Clico and so on. But we persevered, we hired expert attorneys, we don't advise ourselves, that's one of the things you learn as government. Don't try to advise yourself, even how smart you think you are. So we hired good attorneys, good consultants. We worked together, myself and Minister Young, we worked together and we were successful. The government was successful in putting CL Financial into liquidation, where it is right now. We had many court battles that went to the High Court, the Court of Appeal, all the way to the Privy Council, and the government was successful throughout. So we preserved and protected taxpayers' funds. One of the things that allowed us to do was to recover some of the 23 billion put in. And one of the recoveries that we succeeded in just this year, actually, was to recover a substantial chunk of Republic Bank. This had been attempted by our predecessors, they failed, we succeeded, and we were able to recover 26% of the shares of Republic Bank for the benefit of the people of this country. We also recovered almost 30% of Angostura and shares in Whitco and shares in One Caribbean Media, which is the parent company of the Express and TV6. So we decided we have to find an instrument now, a vehicle to give back to the people, to return to the people what had been spent using taxpayers' funds. So we looked at many different options. We looked at forming a company like NEL, the National Enterprise Limited. 
but Nell had not done so well. And many people in Trinidad and Tobago are not sophisticated investors. So we felt that the appetite was not there and the risk might be too high with a company like Nell, which would depend on the success or failure of the companies that you would put into the asset base of an entity like that. So we said, let's not do that. Then we looked at creating a fund with units similar to the Clico Investment Fund, which was set up by our predecessor government, but that also had not done so well. The units in the Clico Investment Fund, or CIF, had lost 20% of their value over the period when they were introduced by the previous government. So we thought to ourselves that creating a fund out of units, again, would have too much risk associated with it, and investors and individuals may not have the appetite for that level of risk. And we had another issue. Why were we doing all of this? Not only would, did we want to give back to the people, we are required to raise at least $4 billion in capital revenue to finance the 2017-2018 budget. Because we get revenue from different sources. We get it from taxation, from income tax, value-added tax, um, customs duties, royalties, except from Petrotrin, and um, other forms of taxation. But we also get revenue from capital revenue, sale of assets. So that in this 2018 budget, there was at least $4 billion that had been uh, projected to be raised by sale of assets. So we had to raise this $4 billion. Otherwise, it would be very, very difficult to complete the financial year. I can tell you now that the government's overdraft, in the absence of this $4 billion in capital revenue, has been over 90% for the last month and was 95% last week. And let me tell you what that means. When the overdraft hits 95%, we have enough money to run the country for three days, to pay for health care, education, national security, all of those social service grants that Minister Coburn spoke about, old age pension and so on. Once we hit 95% with the overdraft, we can run the country for three days. But we have funds coming in all the time, but small amounts. So that it was absolutely critical that we raise this $4 billion in capital revenue through this instrument. So we thought about it and we said, look, we have a dual purpose here. We need to raise money to balance the budget or to fund the budget is a better way of looking at it. And we want to give back to the population because a lot of people's money went into the Clico bailout. So we came up with the NIF bonds. And let me tell you what's so good about the NIF bonds. We took all the risk out so that we decided to pay very attractive, very generous interest rates. And based on research, because we had a team of experts, again, we didn't advise ourselves. When we got to this point using experts Accountants, auditors, lawyers, bankers advised us on what was the best instrument that would achieve our objective, our twin objectives of giving back something good and also raising the $4 billion which we desperately need. So we came up with these bonds. To make them attractive, we decided that we would make the interest rates, we'd have them in three series because you have different investors outside there. You have individuals, you have companies, you have institutions such as uh, National Insurance Board, Unit Trust. You have people's organizations like credit unions. You have insurance companies, banks, and so on. So yeah, there's a wide array of potential investors outside there. So we decided to have three series, five-year, 12-year, 20-year. And in each case, the interest goes up. So the interest on the five-year bonds was fixed at 4.5%, which is 1% above the rate at which the government borrows money with a government sovereign guarantee. And 
five times what you would get in a bank if you had a deposit account. If you look at the Abercrombie account, for example, at FCB, you get about 0.8% from that. Other deposit accounts, you get 0.5%. Some of them, you get nothing at all. So that the 4.5% on the five-year bonds is five times what you might get out the outside there from a normal investment. The 12-year, we put it at 5.7, 1% again above the government rate if we were borrowing money from the private sector for 12 years. And the 20-year, which is an innovation, it's not been done before in any significant way, we set that at 6.6%, 6 .6%, again, 1% above the government rate, the government guaranteed rate. And that is based on market research. We didn't do it by VAPs. So that you have risk disappears. You don't have to worry about if you buy shares like NEL, whether it will go up or down. You have a fixed guaranteed interest rate uh, that is a very attractive and very generous interest rate. We then decided to give people comfort. So we took the companies that we had recovered from Clico in particular, because Republic Bank came from Clico Investment Bank, and the other Angostura with Co. OCM came from Colonial Life. We took those companies and we put them into a state enterprise, a special purpose state enterprise called the NIF Holding Company. And those are the assets that back the bonds. And we decided in order to reduce or minimize any possible apprehension people might have, that the assets would be twice the bonds. So we put $8 billion worth of assets into the NIF Holding Company, and I can give you a, s a small idea of how the $8 billion is made up. We have Republic Bank, which, has a, which makes up about 55% of the shareholding in NIF. Angostura is about 12%. We put a state enterprise in there as well, a power producer, Trinidad Generation Unlimited, that makes up 25%, and the other ones are small. So Republic Bank is more than 4 billion out of the 8 billion in assets. So we have asset to liability 2 to 1, which is a very strong capital ratio. We then decided for institutions like Unitrust, NIB, who, are, who have a responsibility to safeguard the people's money, that we go and get a credit rating, and that is to give them additional comfort. So we went to an organization called Cari Chris, which is the Caribbean credit rating agency, and we got a rating on the bonds, a AA rating, which is investment grade. So we were very, very careful about what we did. And in the prospectus, which we offered to the public, we made it clear that individuals, people, ordinary people, all sorts of people, people of every type, would get 100% of whatever they applied for, because this is for the people, and the other entities, the institutions and so on, would get a prorated amount depending on the success of the diff at the end of the day. So we very carefully, over a six-month period, designed in an instrument which, based on expert advice, was bound to succeed, because Blue chip assets, blue chip companies that's, whose value is hardly likely to reduce, like Republic Bank. Republic Bank's value is hardly likely to reduce. In fact, its share value has quadrupled over the last 20 years or so. And companies like Angostura and so on, these are blue chip companies. So we did everything that we possibly could to ensure that people's money would be safe and that they would get a very good return on their investment and we did the additional rating for institutional investors and corporations. And this is what our opponents had to say about this very well-designed arrangement. The leader of the opposition said it was a Ponzi scheme. No guarantee that people will be repaid. It will collapse. Now, a Ponzi scheme is named after a fellow called Charles Ponzi, an American. And what a Ponzi scheme is like a pyramid scheme. So you invite people to invest in something, and you promise them a huge 
return and then you invite the next set of people and you use the money from the second set to pay back the first set and then you invite the next set of people and you use from the third set to pay back the second set and so you go the fourth pays back the third the fifth pays back the fourth that's a ponzi scheme there are no assets backing a ponzi scheme there's nothing it's just a con but this was described by the leader of the opposition as a Ponzi scheme, something where you have $8 billion in blue chip assets backing $4 billion in bonds. My description of the leader of the opposition's ridiculous um, statement was, I, I could only come up with one word, childish. That was my response to that, childish. Then Mr. Mark, said the small man will not benefit. Friends and family of the PNM will put front men to buy bonds. That is Mark. Botewari say nobody would be interested in investing in this. The economy has crashed. Nobody would invest in NIF. And then the other ones like Gopi Singh and, and Dukaran and all of them just poured cold water on the NIF and said it was nonsense, bound to fail. People have no confidence in the economy. They have no confidence in the PNM, etc. Well, let me tell you what actually happened. So we went out there to raise four billion dollars. <laughs> let me tell you what happened when the applications were counted and double counted and triple counted I had to make sure I got it right the total applications or subscriptions to the NIF are a little more than four billion dollars so we achieved our target the total is 7.3 billion dollars Eighty-two percent oversubscribed. And let me give you some breakdowns. In the five year, where we were looking for about eight hundred million, the applications are two point one billion. In the twelve year, where you're looking for between eight hundred million and one point two billion, the applications are one point six billion. But the shocker, the shocker was the 20 year because remember if somebody is investing in something for 20 years it means they have tremendous confidence in the asset and the instrument we are looking for somewhere between 800 million and 2 billion we got 3.5 billion dollars in the 20 year And the total number of applications by all types, individuals, companies, institutions, etc., 8,116. But here it is. The to out of that 8,116 applications are total, the 7.3 billion, check how many individuals there were. 7,436. 7,436 out of 8,116 were people, individual people. So the NIF has been a fantastic success. Fantastic. And the funds, we'll get the funds within the next week to 10 days. It will drop the overdraft from 95 percent probably down to about 50 percent i haven't seen that for a long time and we will be able to pay some bills we'll be able to pay some bills so despite all the things that the naysayers said the nif has turned out to be a success the population has shown tremendous confidence in the government and in the PNM government in particular, and the things that we have done. It's not the first time. We did a, a road show back in 2016 where we went to the United States to raise one billion US dollars to finance the budget. 
and there were all sorts of speculation about how it couldn't be done and the, nobody was interested in Trinidad and Tobago and the economy was in trouble and that the general outside world had no confidence in the PNM government. That's the kind of old talk we got in 2016. And after the roadshow, it was very grueling. We had to go from business place to business place to bank to bank, entity to entity. Every 20 minutes, you're doing a presentation on Trinidad and Tobago, its economy, its government. They had a stopwatch, actually, when you hit 20 minutes, they stop. You jump in a car, you drive 15 minutes, you go to another bank or financial institution, you make another marketing pitch on Trinidad and Tobago. We did that from 6 in the morning to 6 in the night for three days. And then on the fourth day, we opened the bond offer, US $1 billion bond offer on the stock exchange, the bond exchange in the United States. We opened at 8 a.m. in the morning, and by 10 a.m., we had 3.5 billion US dollars in offers. So it's not the first time, it's not the first time this PNM government has done what it was said by the naysayers that we could not do. So we just keep moving on. Now let me talk to you about something the Prime Minister raised, which is housing bonds. Because of the tremendous success of the NIF bond issue, as I said, we are raising four billion. We can't accept more than four because that's what the prospectus had in it. We've discovered now there's over three billion dollars in surplus funds in the country crying out for investment, looking for a good investment. So we decided to tap into that spare capacity outside there with housing bonds. Now, housing bonds are a special type of bond. The purpose of a housing bond is to raise capital to build houses, as simple as that. And our housing bonds will be designed in such a way that persons who purchase housing bonds would be able to use them to acquire HTC housing, public housing, and whatever they have put into the bonds, they can put that towards the house. But in addition, we're going to structure it in such a way that the persons who invest in the housing bonds would have a special window into the acquisition of HTC housing. So it allows people to save so that the housing bonds will also have very attractive interest rates. It allows people to save for a particular purpose. It allows them to use their savings, their bonds, to buy a home, which is one of the most or more important things to families. But what the, the housing bonds will do as well, it will give us the money that we require to kickstart or to continue the housing program that the ACC is currently engaging. We're going to float an issue of the order of $1.5 billion in housing bonds so that we can get our HCC projects going. We can pay our contractors. We can accelerate the construction of houses. And the bonds, in due course, initially we will start with a government guarantee. With these bonds, these bonds are a little different. But in due course, the mortgage payments, when people purchase the houses and they convert the interest to mortgage loans, the proceeds of the mortgage loans will go into a sinking fund to repay the bonds when they become due. And these are short-term bonds. These bonds can be three years because you can construct a house and convert to mortgage in three years or less. You could do it in two years if you're very efficient. So that these bonds will be even more attractive as far as I am concerned than the NIF bonds because of the short period of the maturity of the bonds. So we're going to continue. We are the Ministry of Finance. We're going to continue to work on this uh, proposal. It's going to happen, I can tell you. It, it will be successful based on NIF. It will give us the money to build houses. 
that the HCC desperately needs, and it will give young people and young families and not so young families the opportunity to save their money, get good interest rates, and also acquire a home built by the Housing Development Corporation. So this is another innovative concept come from the uh, PNM government. In fact, it is, a, it is an idea of the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. I wouldn't um, take credit for it at all. This is the Prime Minister's idea. It's a fantastic idea. It's done in many, many countries. And I think with this um, initiative, and we can use this initiative to do other things as we go along, but this will allow people to acquire property, to get returns on their investments, and to become own owners. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of old talk out there, out there about the government is incompetent. We don't know what we're doing. Stupid. But the success of NIF shows us that, in contrast, this is a very focused, competent, and high-performing PNM administration. And we're going to keep on. We're going to keep on demonstrating that we are high performers and we are highly competent and we can do it. And performance will be our measure as we go forward towards the next general election. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Minister Imbert, as he answers his critics about NIF. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatness of a man is not about how much wealth he acquires, but in his integrity and his ability to affect those around him positively. And I and all the ministers can attest to that. Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley's integrity and commitment to these two islands in the blue Caribbean Sea, where every creed and race can find an equal place is unparalleled. With that, I ask you to stand and welcome to the podium the Member of Parliament for Diego Martin West, the political leader of the People's National Movement, and the Prime Minister of these two great islands in the Caribbean Sea, Dr. The Honorable Keith. Christopher Rowley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman who is the Member of Parliament for St. Joseph, our Minister of Health, Mr. Terence Dale Singh, our party officers, my cabinet colleagues, of whom there are many here tonight. I wouldn't want to go through the whole list, but um, we do have a Member of Parliament for Arima, who is our Minister of Education, the Member of Parliament for Lupino Bonaire West, who is our Minister of Family Services and Social Services, the Member of Parliament for Dabadi, Amira, who is uh, with us, I understand this facility is in Dabadi, Amira. Yeah. And so we have Brigadier General Antoine, retired, who is here this evening, and I hope you would have accepted his invitation to the various activities that um, he's spearheading here in the constituency. <laughs> and uh, we have our uh, representatives from various councils, the chairman of our corporations in the East here, and a number of councillors, and most importantly, we have with us members of the media and the members of the community of these areas that we mentioned. And we are going, I understand, broadcasting quite widely on the electronic media tonight. So we do have quite a wide listening audience, and I would like to wish them a very good evening and thank them for listening to this PNM meeting. We even have Mr. Fitzgerald Hines in the dry shirt. But I want to acknowledge him not just as the hard-working 
highly respected member of parliament for Laventille West, but as the acting attorney general of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to see so many of you gathered here tonight at such short notice. And this is symptomatic of um, what happens at the PNM. We can call you out and you come out because you pay attention to your country, because you believe in this country. The uh, warnings from the Met Office was that you should stay home because we were expecting bad weather today. And unfortunately, um, it appears as though we have been spared the worst and that the tropical um, disturbances have passed us with only um, some bearable lighter showers. And um, you've come out to hear what the PNM has to say to you and to the country, and for that I'm very grateful. We are in a good mood in the PNM. Some would say we are on a roll, because last Sunday we had a family day in the center of the country, as central as we could get, in what we call central. We were in Edinburgh 500. And many people were surprised when they came to that venue to see the thousands of persons who were gathered there. Because the constant narrative of some in this period of difficulty, where, as is to be expected, there are some persons who are experiencing difficulties, there are some livelihoods which have been affected negatively by our changed circumstances. So those who don't wish us well, or even those who don't wish the country well, were carrying a narrative that the government had been disconnected from its base and the PNM had lost its base and the PNM had lost support and the Prime Minister is the most, this and the Prime Minister, that. And we called to come and have a day of fun and family celebration. And to the surprise of many of them, not to us, there were thousands of people in that venue. And we have 41 constituencies in the country. And as is traditional in those uh, family days, because we've had our family days annually. Initially, it used to be held at any hard ground. But on becoming a leader of the party, we decided to take the event around the country. Because it's a day of fun and family, and we, at, by taking it around the country, we allow more of our members and supporters to participate if we bring it to them rather than to just rely on those who come to Eddie Hart Ground. So we've been to Manzanilla, we've been to Point Fourteen, we've been to San Fernando, we've been to Tobago, we've been to Port of Spain, and this year we were in Edinburgh 500. And I'm very happy for that because we are a very organized party. And I'll go further. We represent every square inch of Trinidad and Tobago. And a main feature of these family days is that March Pass, because it allows our constituencies to express themselves in a variety of ways in some kind of competition for the political leaders trophy and other trophies that are available. So our young people and our organizers or movers and shakers in the various constituencies do something for the family day, especially the March Pass. And this year, we had 30 constituencies taking part. 30 constituencies in our March Pass. Some of them were so eager that they didn't want the police and the prison band to play for them, they wanted their own music. And we never know what they're going to do because sometimes they hide what they're doing, they hide their choreography, they hide their ideas because they want to surprise the judges and of course surprise us, the leadership. So we're on the podium and one constituency, very innovative because they got the winning measure, they addressed their people in red, white and black and they were going to march and dance the choreography to the national anthem. Well, of course, the first time we're seeing that or hearing that, we are on the podium, but fortunately, we are such a disciplined party that when that was told to everybody that the national anthem would be played, the entire thousands stood up in silence. So, of course, they couldn't do that. 
Because had they done that, we would have had to apologize to the entire country. But of course, there were others. One constituency, Tabakit, decided to put on a skit. And while this skit was being organized, within our group on the podium, because I had on the podium a number of party officers, and we were saying, we really have to put some guidelines out there because the march pass is turning away from the military type of march pass that we have traditionally been um, accustomed to, to uh, too much theater. And we were seeing these, I heard they were gorillas, I thought they were just Chinese costumes. <laughs> and they were putting on this kit, and eventually this kit was put on, and okay, I, all right, they took part, and they left. And I want to show you something. Look at that screen. Could you? Look at the left side of that screen. That is a skit. To us, gathered there, the, those who put that on explained to us what it was about after that it was a transformation of Tabakit becoming PNM. Because statistically, we had performed better in Tabakit than we had before. We'd moved from 5,000 odd votes to 7,000 odd votes. We, our number of party groups have moved from, I think, 7 to 15 or 17, and that was their way of expressing it with a dancer who danced in the performance and was covered in a yellow sari, and the sari was removed to expose a PNM red com, uh, garment. That was it. That's what we saw. That's what we saw. On the right side, on the right side of the picture, that's it. Put, come back to the first picture, please. And that's what, it's all, that's, that's what I want to show you, just the first one. The very first picture you showed. On the right side, that is a serious spiritual, religious expression of something that is extremely significant to the Hindu population. That's what they saw. We saw on the left, they saw on the right. On the left, we were having a skit of a transformation. On the right, they saw serious insult to their religious mythology. Ladies and gentlemen, when this skit was performed, we left that function basically on a high because we had a very successful family day. And then, of course, we came under tremendous attack from our political opponents. And what shocked me and many others was that the attack we came under, we were accused of rape, glorifying violence against women, and all kinds of nefarious activities. And we reacted by saying, you all are just going overboard now. You have been doing this for too long. And you have been now, you have put yourself in a situation now where you just have said too much and done too much. But the political voices were not the only voices. There were other voices. And that caught my attention. And I decided to see why the Hindu community, through its leaders, was so offended by our skit. And last week was a learning week for me. I never knew what the Mahabharata was. But because of the nastiness of the reaction and the conversation that was not there to the PNM's family day, this PNM that has led this country since 1956, and we are, this is our 63rd year as a political party, if they had something to say to us, our political opponents were so gleeful in looking for the opportunity to divide and to be nasty that we had to pay attention. And in paying attention, talking to you here tonight, gathered as PNM members and supporters, 
and talking to the national community, we became conscious of the sensitivity. And tonight, on behalf of the People's National Movement and all concerned, I unreservedly apologize to the Hindu community for that. One has to be conscious to be sensitive. One has to be ever conscious to be sensitive. And because there were so many people in that gathering, starting from the constituency level, right up to the political leadership of this organization and the thousands gathered there, because we could not see the sensitivity and the hurt that would be carried to those members of the Hindu community, it points to a failure in our national education system. We ought to know more about each other. And if nothing happens out of this, it brings us to a place as a nation where we ought to resolve to carry a better conversation between the various components of this country. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very diverse country. Trinidad and Tobago probably is the most diverse country in the world. Everything that the world has is represented in our country. And therefore, we have to be careful. And we ought to take note, those who see it as an opportunity to be embraced gleefully, so as to use it for purposes. I mean, it was interesting that the comments that came from our political opponents were all offensive attacks. There was not one of them who could have said, except, of course, and he doesn't qualify as a political opponent, Satmaraj. Satmaraj saw it, saw what we did, and he gave us the benefit of the doubt. Tonight, I want to thank Mr. Satmaraj. for showing national leadership. Because you could imagine what would have happened in the deterioration of the discourse and the fueling of hatred if he had joined them and said, the PNM is glorifying rape, the PNM is disregarding the Hindu population, and the PNM hates the Hindu population, and so on and so on. All that would have done is to deepen the hatred that some people believe that if they fuel it, they will prosper by it. So when this nastiness began to come our way, I took the opportunity after initially taking objection to them ascribing their behavior to us, I took the opportunity to consult with the Hindu leadership. I took the opportunity to, con to, con to, to, con to consult with people who are known to me who are Hindus. And that is when I realized how deeply hurt and offended they were by what we thought was simply a portrayal of one constituency going. The significant part of that thing is that, let me tell you what the story is. And um, permit me, I'm not here um, trying to be ecclesiastical. Let me just explain to you what it is. It's, it comes deeply from inside Hindu mythology. This Mahabharata is about a woman, a woman of great virtue, strong woman who uh, represents everything that is good. Her husband lost her in a game. In a game, they were gambling, and the husband gambled away everything, including himself gambled away himself and lost and therefore became a slave. But you know what gamblers do, those of you who are the playway players and the whoever players you know, no matter how you lose, you always figure the next toss of the dice I'm going to win, the husband, all he had left in the game of gambling was the wife. And he gambled the wife and lost. And she was then put in a situation of becoming a slave because she was lost in the gamble. But she was a strong woman. She was a fighting woman. 
She was a woman who didn't take what was in front of her, but wanted to shape what was in front of her. And she came before the gathering of the leaders, of course, all men. And she defended herself and the condition into which she was put by her husband. She was a bright woman. You know what she was arguing? Since he had lost and became a slave, he had no right to gamble me because as a slave, he did not own me and therefore I was not lost to him. And she appealed to all these leaders and rulers. She was a queen. And she appealed to all of them and not one of them, not one of them would stand in her defense. The sentence must be carried out, the condition must be met because the person who won her, what he wanted to do to this virtuous woman was to expose her nakedness in front of all of these men as part of his victory. And the sari, the yellow sari that she was wearing was ordered to be removed from her. And this was being done. And of course, in the religious aspect of it, the gods intervened, Lord Krishna intervened. And no matter how they pulled the sari, it became an endless sari that never ended and her virtue was never exposed. That is the root of their religion. Those of us in the Christian religion, those of us who are practitioners, some of us don't go to church very often, but we claim to be Christians. We do, we too have stories. We too have stories in our religion that would become very upset if other persons treat our beliefs in that way. And that is where dignity is. And that is why we have to pay attention to what our founding fathers put us to observe. It's written in letter and in spirit in our constitution, in our founding documents, that the dignity of the human being is paramount in Trinidad and Tobago. And if you insult somebody or if you upset somebody that way, especially if you threaten their spiritual comfort, you have to apologize. And that is why tonight... Having learned what we have learned, we as an organization, we have no difficulty and there's no shame in apologizing to the Hindu community and this has been learned. And what it says to us is that to avoid this kind of thing developing in this kind of society that we need to educate our people and our children in particular. I had a meeting a few years ago the president in that meeting was Dr. Lady Seth, Sir Patrick Manning, myself and Satmaraj at Lakshmi Girls School in St. Augustine. And we sat down to have a conversation about this kind of thing where we need to know more about each other and where our government has to be sensitive to all that represents the components of our country. And in this, we, we went around the table talking about ourselves to one another. And I, coming from Tobago, had to admit my ignorance of the cultures in Trinidad because Tobago does not have a large Muslim population. Tobago does not have a large Hindu population. And when I grew up in Tobago, there were virtually none. I could have counted on one hand the number of Muslims in Tobago and on the other hand, the number of Hindus. So I didn't have that. And in the school system, there was no teaching of it. So, I learned about the, Mah the Mahabharata as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And I took umbrage when political opponents accused us of rape and violating human um, women and glorifying violence against women because I did not understand the significance of the yellow and the significance of the yellow sari and the insult that could be to persons for whom that is a deep spiritual entity. And I have to say, I take it that our, our people from Tabakit, they might have had an idea, but they didn't understand the extent to which the idea could reflect negatively on what other people see as the appreciation of their culture and their religion. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not who we are. 
and we will allow no one to tell us that that is who we are. We are not rapists. We are not advocates for violence against women. This PNM, our record in Trinidad and Tobago, is one of lifting up the woman, and women got more advanced under the PNM in our period than under the entire history of this country. You know, as I was sitting there, I made a couple of notes about how we went about organizing this country. Let me share some of it with you. When in Britain they passed a law, you remember Britain was our colonial master? They passed a law in 1966 to allow equal pay for men and women and they glorified themselves in Europe over that. But you know the PNM government had put that in place in Trinidad long before 1966. It's one of the first things we did in recognizing the equality of women and men says equal pay for equal work. That's a PNM legacy in this country. We take that for granted now. Women are the ones who are most closely responsible for the bringing up of our children and ensuring that they are properly looked after in the house and the household. The school feeding program is a PNM initiative meant to respond to the women in our society who are saying, help us raise our children. Legislation to make spousal rape an offense is a PNM government that made that illegal in this country. <laughs> Remember the famous clause four? You remember it? I know you would. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the legislation to protect common law arrangements where people who live without having gone to a church or a mosque or mandi and they have a family in this country, the PNM passed a law to recognize and protect women and their children in this country. We also passed legislation to ensure that children born out of wedlock and this whole question of women having nothing to hold on to because they weren't married to a man, that their children were protected, there was an inheritance right and so on, that is the PNM's record. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our record. And against that kind of record, that kind of responsibility, we must let nobody, nobody come out and point their finger at us and paint us in this country in the way that the political opponents try to paint us. And ladies and gentlemen, only recently, we passed legislation to abolish child marriage in this country. And for the entire debate, for the entire debate, the PNM stood alone in the parliament. It was only at the moment of the voting where there was a sudden 360 degrees by those who opposed it to maintain it, where we showed them A.G. Faris Aluhari came with the data and showed that it was the women who were the receivers of the worst of that backward arrangement. They brought specialist child speakers into the parliament to defend the status quo and the PNM stood up for women and children and girls and we passed the law. We of the PNM our record in making women first in this country. The first chairman of a corporation in this country was a PNM officer. The first minister of government in the cabinet who was a woman was a PNM minister. The first leader of the House of Parliament is a PNM appointee. Today in this part in this country, as I speak to you. Under PNM recognition of the quality and equality of women, we have the president of Trinidad and Tobago as a woman. The leader of the House of Representatives is a woman. The leader of the Senate is a woman. And these people are going to try to come and tell us from their political nothingness to tell them that we are anti-woman and we are anti-female and we are glorifying rape and we are advancing violence against women, that I reject in its totality. <laughs> Prior to 1960, only boys got scholarships in this country. 
It was after 1960 the PNM changed it and made scholarships available on merit to women and men, boys and girls in this country. So our records stand for ourselves. But they seem, they seem to have been delighted for the opportunity to fall their way to accuse the PNM of rape. I saw a posting in this situation put up for public and international digestion and consumption by a former governor of the central bank, a former temporary UNC senator, a, a, a citizen called Jawala Rambaran. He claims to be a professional person in this country and an expert of some kind and a pontificator. He's on the UNC platform on a regular basis. You know how he dealt with this situation? He never came into the conversation and said to us that what you have done there could be offensive to the people and therefore Hindu people are offended. Check, check yourself and see what you've done there. Had that been the conversation, we would have checked ourselves and we would have seen that we were wrong and we would have apologized in the way I have done tonight. But you know what Jawala published? I think he has, he was, I think he's gone to court or he say he was going to court because the Minister of Finance didn't approve him to go for some international job or something like that. You know what he wrote? and publish it on his Facebook page, Paul to see and read, that what happened at Edinburgh 500 in that Tabakid skit is the Prime Minister's personal and private fantasy of raping the opposition leader. That is what Jawala Rambaran published in that situation. So here it is, a genuine a genuine situation of a, an idea that was simple and simplistic, that was offensive in truth, that was seen by Satmaraj early as nothing to be over, go overboard about, but needed to be pointed out that there is something that you must know. That was the outcome. And he was not alone because there are some people, including the opposition leader, that seem to have an obsession in painting me as a rapist. Next week, Saturday, I'm going to have a meeting in Tunapuna. And I invite you all, on that occasion, I will invite you to let us discuss what is in our society being advanced by its leaders in the question of rape, in the question of violence, and in the question of divisiveness, where they are looking for openings to create discord and destruction in this country. They are saboteurs, and I will show them to you next week, Saturday. I invite you to that meeting. But the conversation that we should be having as a people, which we must have as a people, is that we need to be talking to one another very civilly all the time, so that if and when something happens, as things will always happen, there will be a civil way of dealing with it, not to go off in glory and in glee and set about to behave in the way that those who call themselves leaders of the Hindu community in the last few days, I will tell you, I took careful note of the comments made by the Hindu women organization and they published an, uh, 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 a, uh, a press release and I read it and I learned and I felt good about it. All is not lost. Because had that been the way it was addressed from the beginning by some of those, that is the conversation that we need to have. Because where they went when they discovered that something had happened is not who we are. That's not who we are. We are a people who strive for, and I dare say would have achieved, unity among our diverse components. We are a people who even today, 
we, have, we are carrying with us a colonial stamp, a colonial stay in our mindset, even in this society today. We, with our European Christian training and acceptance of God, we look down on African religion. If it comes in the form of Orisha or whatever else, we look down on it because we were, we were trained by our history and our development to accept God as only in the European version. And there are people in this country who do the same with Hinduism. We need to have that conversation if we say every creed and race have an equal place. And for those who want to put that as what the PNM is, we are never going to accept that because if there's any organization that brought change and respect at the national level to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, it is the People's National Movement. It was said to me in my discussion with the members of the Hindu community who I spoke to in the last three or four days, they said to me, you know, the effect of the hurt that we experience is equivalent to if in your celebration at Christianity, Christianity there's a crash somewhere at Christmas time where you're celebrating the birth of Christ and you accept it in the way and then you portray a person representing a Hindu who comes out of a bar with a bottle of beer in his hand and use the crush as a urinal. That is the kind of insult that you would take. And you have to understand where spirituality is and how religion is the largest com contributor to discord in the world. You ever heard me say this before? Look around the world at all the disturbance that makes the news, invariably, it has something to do with religion and belief. So you cannot disregard a person's hurt if there's a belief involved. And because you may not believe it, it may only be a story, but it is a guide of people's lives. And we are not playing with lives. We are building a nation of Trinidad and Tobago. And tonight, I want to appeal to the national community to let this be a learning experience to all of us. All of you who might not have been involved in the PNM or in the PNM's family day, you would have been involved in the conversation that flowed from it and what we saw wasn't good. It was ugly. It was detrimental to the preservation of our national fabric, if only in the way we dealt with it. The way it was dealt with. And when I speak to you next Saturday, you will see the hypocrisy and the dangers of those who led the charge last Monday morning to try to portray this as something that it was not. To, to overplay it in such a way that it will be damaging and hurtful. Not that they were confined to saying that what you did was wrong. They wanted to make sure that it was damaging. And that is the point that I want to make. That if your objective is to damage, then you are worse than those who conceptualize it in error. There are people in this country who are taking and who have been taking our social stability for granted and who are prepared to knowingly organize themselves to put at risk this stability that we enjoy in Trinidad and Tobago. And I say to them tonight, once again, you have failed because as the PRM recognizes the shortcomings, we, as part of our nation building, we have no difficulty whatsoever in acknowledging any shortcoming and moving forward with boundless faith in our destiny. You see, tonight, you heard from two ministers, two 
very important ministers in this government. One, the Minister of Finance, whose job it is to find the revenues and to allocate them to service the country. And the other, the Minister of Family Services and Social Development, whose job it is to spend that portion of the money that is meant to support the society, those persons who are least able to look after themselves. Those two ministries, working hand in hand, have been able, in a very difficult period for the country, not for the PNM, because there will always be a government in this country, thank God. But the country is going through a difficult period. But the country has taken steps to ensure that as we cut back to balance or to fit our affordable profile, our affordability profile, that the one thing we did not do is to take from those who were least able to contribute to the national reductions. And that is what the Minister of Family Services and Social Development demonstrated to you tonight as to how many persons, 10% of this country is in receipt of cash payments from the state every month towards their daily well-being, 10% of the country. And this is a non-contributory arrangement because the, the, the old age pension is a non-contributory non pension. All the other grants are meant to help those who are least able to help themselves. And in a situation where we have serious financial constraints, that is the one area that we have not touched. And those who are gleeful in trying to undermine this country, whether it's a social fabric, whether it's a boat we buy for the country, whether, whatever it is, the saboteurs and the underminers, she told you tonight that they were teething from those people who were least able to help themselves. All those people who knowingly were accepting food cards. And they know that they cannot stand scrutiny. So when you call and ask to identify yourself, and how many thousand? 13,000 13, people didn't turn up. 18,000? 18,000 people who were on the food card system before the 7th of September 2015. 18,000 people are not there. Not because we don't want to give them a food card, you know but because they have withdrawn themselves knowing that they were teething from people who were hungry. And you see, tonight, I want to say to the leader of the opposition, who is a tongue crier all over the country, on this subject of the government doesn't care and Rowley doesn't care, I'm glad she knows that a prime minister must care because it's, if she believes that, then if you know people were stealing a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, a million dollars, a hundred million dollars, then you should have cared to prevent them from stealing the public money. Right in the office of the prime minister, there were functionaries known to the Prime Minister who were in receipt of millions of dollars of payment from contractors who were overcharging the taxpayers. How many prosthetic legs could that have bought? How many people they could have fed in the school feeding program? How many caregivers that could have given? She had no interest in that then because all they were about was tiffing out the last red cent in the treasury. And now all of a sudden, you're up and down the country talking about who doesn't care, who doesn't care. But I tell you something. This country is made up largely of decent, right-thinking citizens, and they know what caring is, they know what responsibility is, and they know what a prime minister is, a prime minister who is serious, one who is working, and one who is working in their interests. So let them go ahead. But there are dangers in their behavior, and I will point it out to you next week Saturday when I meet you in Tunapuna. Ladies and gentlemen, this PLM that you are a part of, when you come to these meetings, 
It is your involvement in this organization and in your interest in your country that keeps this country together. And as Dr. Williams said, without the PNM, the alternative is chaos. And we have had chaos in the last five years before we came into office. We are untangling some of that chaos now. And at the end of the day, the country will be better off for the government of the People's National Movement. <laughs> Last week, when is it, Monday? Monday, I went to Point 14, the same day of all the rains and the flood. I went to Point 14 to take part in the distribution of keys to some fortunate families, I think it was 71 families, who would have had access now to a decent home which they are paying for through the HDC mortgage program. Would you believe that that was a project that I had started in 2004? That was left untouched halfway through and abandoned for five years. The following day, I went to Arima and 76 families were given, were, were had, had the opportunity to get what I will say to you were the most attractive housing units ever built in the public sector and built by small contractors. <laughs> the 76 units were built by three contractors, three contractors, each one building a portion. Some, some there were a few single family dwelling houses, there were some two-bedroom units, some three-bedroom units. And what struck me and gave me the satisfaction that this government is doing what it is supposed to do and is having an impact on the people at the household level is that we were able, the HTC was able to get that, that project finished on the northern side of the river. They're still working on some more on the other side of the river. And the units were sold for 750,000 or 650,000, depending on which. Compare that, ladies and gentlemen, with $1.2 million. When we came into office, the price of an HDC unit at that time was upwards of a million dollars. Two contractors, two contractors, were given two projects, each of over a billion dollars apiece. We used three small contractors. We got it done, and we got it done at the cost I just mentioned. It is PNM policy that 10% of government contracting should deliberately be directed to small contractors. That was a policy that I pursued in the housing department and in other ministries, it was followed as well. But because housing had this construction going on, we brought small contractors to um, Eastern Credit Union's La, um, La Jolla, to La Jolla. We filled the hall with small contractors. We gave them an opening to get training how to manage their books, how to do quantity surveying work. And not all of them were perfect, but we said if some of them got into the program and they grew, we built in society and we opened and made space for them. So on this occasion, while there are big contractors still in the program, we made way for small contractors and in that particular project in Arima, those three small contractors came through with flying colors. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have to think positively. We have to anticipate a good outcome. When you wake up in the morning and you say your prayers, you look forward to a good day. Many of you, the first thing I see on my phone every morning, you, you, you send me a, a text. Sometimes I have to search through the pile of them to find my work. That is my work phone. Contrary to what somebody sang in a calypso, I have not changed my phone. It's the same phone I use. So many people know the number and you flood me with these, have a good day, God bless you, because you expect the best to happen during the day. 
I thank you for it, but ease me up a little bit, right? <laughs> because it makes me have to work too hard to fight. If I don't go through the mountain, something important can get lost. So I, I'm forced to go through all of it when the day comes. But it's a pleasant exercise. But you see, you have to have a positive spirit in life. If you want a positive outcome, otherwise you would lose opportunities because you would believe that it cannot be done. There are people who are beating down this country with negatives and you would believe that everything in this country is the worst in the world and therefore you can't even enjoy a good day. I ask you to reject them. Yes, we are going through difficult times, but difficult times don't last forever. You have to have a positive spirit in engaging the difficulty. And if it is worth having, it's worth working for. And when you overcome it, there's a feeling like no other. And it's called success through your efforts and the strength of your character. So I ask you to reject the naysayers. I ask you to be positive. I ask you to have faith in yourselves, in your families, your friends, and in your government, and in your country. And if we do that, at the end of the day, we'll say, great is Trinidad and Tobago. Great is Trinidad and Tobago. We are great people and we have prevailed. I feel like home. I have never been more sure that I, Terence Dial Singh, made the right choice to be a member of the People's National Movement. I have never been more sure that tonight we saw a leader, a man of integrity, lead this country. And that is why we say, great is the PNM. I have never been more sure that this country is in the right hands of Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, and that every creed and race will always find an equal place. Dr. Rowley, on behalf of a grateful country, we say thank you. <laughs> Next week, Saturday, we are in Tunapuna. Look out for the venue, look out for the time, and we guarantee another bumper meeting. Before we close, we have an announcement. On the 30th of August, at Bali Say House, several things will be taking place. One, the first draw for the 10-car raffle. I think three cars will be drawn. Do you have your tickets? Because if you don't have a ticket, you don't have a chance. We will be drawing the first of the three cars. Be there at 5 p.m. Another historic occasion will also, be, will also be taking place. We, the People's National Movement, will be transitioning from Balize House as you know it because we'll be having the short turn in for the new PNM headquarters. Give yourselves a round of applause. An historic event in the making. We will be turning the sort for that. And we'll be having a pre Independence Day event, a fun event to once again galvanize this country as the party of independence, the party that brought you independence, the party that brought you the Republican um, Constitution, and we are there once again to celebrate. So ladies and gentlemen, as we close tonight, go home to your home safely. Go home to your places safe in the knowledge that you have made the right choice. You have elected the right government, the right prime minister, the right government to lead this country along the right path to independence, to republicanism, and in the future, you are in the right hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Reach home safely. God bless you all.